It's that time again. The annual conference of the American Society of Ag Consultants, otherwise known as ASAC, is going to be held in Fort Myers, Florida, this November 4th and 5th. Kirk Covington is one of nine professionals who will address the conference. The other speakers who will cover a wide range of topics represent Florida Farm Bureau, Florida Citrus Commission, University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture, National Ag Law Center, Risk Mitigators and Advisors, Tyler Associates, as well as the lead economist for dairy at Cobank, and myself, Chrissy Wozniak, from North American Ag. The day and a half of presentations will be followed by ag tours on Tuesday afternoon at Echo Farms, one of my favorite places here in Fort Myers. Attendees will experience farming at its most creative, with unique demonstrations, plants, and techniques being used to help farmers and urban gardeners in developing countries. A second tour at ECHO will showcase simple technologies that can improve food, water, and shelter for millions of people. A third tour of a hydroponic grower is also being planned. For more information and to register, visit www.agconsultants.org. That's www.agconsultants.org. See you there. Wozniak. My guest today is embedded in the rich history of the Florida citrus industry. His family legacy extends back to 1900 when his great-grandfather planted their first citrus grove in the great state of Florida. The trajectory of his journey encompasses a noteworthy stint on the New York City trading floor during college where his father played a crucial role in the creation of the Orange Juice Futures contract And over the course of his career, he transitioned from working as a CPA with Ernst and and Winnie to successfully running a startup for 11 years. Later, he assumed leadership of his father's commodity trading business at Citigroup and Morgan Stanley in response to challenges faced by the citrus industry. His attention shifted to the emerging sector of bamboo farming in 2019. And as part of this transition, he co-founded Greenfield Bamboo Investments and established the Florida Bamboo Growers Association with the vision to cultivate a healthy, competitive, and prosperous bamboo farming industry. And uh, it, he's at the forefront of this burgeoning agricultural frontier. And when most people think about Florida, they think Mickey Mouse, perfect sandy beaches, or the hot and un- unpredictable climate. Most people don't understand the rich history of Florida ag and the endless opportunity here. Today, we're going to discuss the Florida citrus industry and the emerging bamboo market with its opportunities and its challenges. From Central Central Florida, I would like to welcome President of Greenfield Bamboo Investments, Kevin Barley. Welcome, Kevin, and thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me on your show, Chrissy. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm always happy to have Floridians on. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's start with your background. You have a really intriguing career path. So can you expand on that? Yeah. So just imagine that uh, my family came to Central Florida around 1900, and it was very much agricultural based at the time. My great-grandfather planted citrus in 1900 and helped uh, found a small town there, Winter Garden. And my dad uh, was in the uh, Korean War and then went into the securities industry and as part of that, helped create the orange juice uh, futures contract. Wow. And this is just part of being connected to citrus during that time. But you remember the uh, the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy, if you do. I mean, it goes back a ways, but it was really funny. And it was all about the orange, the citrus industry and the orange juice futures contract. So that was filmed on the New York trading floor right at the time that I happened to be working there, you know, a summer uh, work uh, uh, and working on the trading floor as a runner. And that was a great experience, but it was the same place they filmed it. Wow. And then I ended up going into public accounting. I uh, did a startup business. I was more of an entrepreneur than an accountant. And then eventually took over my dad's business, like you, you mentioned, working with all of the orange juice industry in helping them manage their price risk using futures 
really around the world. And then I even created a new futures contract for apple juice con uh, concentrate at the time. But I had been connected to citrus throughout this. It's uh, just part of it. And I, I love that part. I can't explain why I have an, you know, an attraction to, uh, to agriculture, but I do. Right. Yeah, that's that's really cool. And and here in Florida, the citrus industry has really suffered unimaginable losses. So can you explain the is issue of citrus greening and give an overview of what has happened? Yeah. And, you know, most agricultural uh, crops have ups and downs. They go through things. Citrus started in the mid 1800s in Florida and was planted all the way up to Jacksonville. And cold weather taught them they needed to move south and over and over they moved further south down to Immokalee, down near uh, south of Lake Okeechobee. And, but they endured these types of challenges. But greening is the, uh, the disease that Florida's contend with. And it is uh, overwhelming. It restricts the vascular system of citrus trees and it reduces their uh, leaves, their ability to produce crops, increases their costs, and it is overwhelming. And so Florida growers have been losing money for 10 to 15 years now. And they, you can't do that uh, forever. And even if you came up with an easy solution to greening today, it would be difficult for growers to get on board with it because they've run out of money. So we have gone from 800,000 acres to a, uh, a little over 300,000 acres in citrus. And all of that is uh, very uh, uh, unproductive, really. It represents the equivalent of about 50,000 acres. So it's a tough business. Right. Yeah. And so Florida's main crop using citrus is orange juice. But this is also affecting grapefruits and limes and everything, right? Oh, yeah. That, that really is true, Chrissy. So everything. It is the biggest crop in Florida. It is huge. And it is it has little hope at the moment. And the people that have orange groves need to do something else with their land. It is just interesting that bamboo has a connection to that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my next question, that, that what are growers turn? to I know stevia and moringa are some of the few crops people are trying out and do well here um, but you've landed on bamboo as well as a lot of other growers so tell me about that industry and and how it's emerging yeah and historically there have been many alternatives or potential alternatives to citrus uh, I talked with some growers and they say you know they've seen 50 of them and they're very skeptical of them and and you can imagine that uh a lot of times it's like taking a crop that grows well up in North Carolina and trying to grow it down here. It's it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, I so, brought plants from up where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> and they all died. <laughs> yeah, and this is the challenge of it. So yeah. what I figured out in, in looking at uh, different crops that might be an alternative is that you need to have some basic uh, uh, parameters met. So, and we found this with bamboo. Okay. Mm -hmm. So number one, it really needs to be farmable at scale. You have to be able to plant a thousand acres without it being a problem. It has to be manageable and, and uh, uh, something that can be done over large acreage. And we have that with bamboo, uh, fortunately. The other thing is people are trying to make money. And so you can't waste their time with something that it really is not going to make any money. So the way I look at it is, you need to have something that is very productive. Well, bamboo is one of the fastest growing plants in the world. And as a result of that, it everything that comes out of the ground is part of its crops. Okay. So productivity translates into money in a sense, uh, profitability. So it has that. And then the third thing is you need to have large existing markets for the crops. If you have to invent the, the market or get it started, that's a long time and, and difficult. We're fortunate that bamboo has large existing markets here right now. So yeah. we check the boxes. Right. So tell me about those markets. I don't think that most people really think too much about bamboo other than when you're Definitely. decorating your tiki bar. I know here that's popular. Right. 
Um, but other than that, you don't really think about bamboo very much as a as a U.S. crop. So, so tell me about what the uses are in yeah. those markets. Yeah, and you're so right about that perspective. People are unaware that bamboo could be a market, and they have their own ideas about it's something from Asia. You know, has nothing to do with us. But six percent of Americans are Asian American, and so we. We have two crops. One is a food crop. The other is a wood crop. So the food crop is when a comb coming out of the ground, when it's in its juvenile stage in the first 10 to 20 inches, that is food. It's a vegetable and it happens to be very healthy and nutritious. It's what you call bamboo shoots. So if you go get Thai food and you get uh, green curry, bamboo shoots are in it. Okay. And they um, have a, a nice soft crunch to them and they're they're flavorful but the main thing is they're very healthy and nutritious they're they're a superfood so on that the u.s imports 60 million pounds of bamboo shoots per year this is a four billion pound industry worldwide okay 60 million comes to the u.s for that asian american population that's here and they they, they want them. And so that's an existing market. And we currently sell to that market our bamboo shoots uh, as fresh produce coming from Florida. You can't get fresh produce from China. Okay, so we're the only ones that have that right now. And we're the only commercial bamboo farmers uh, in the country. And so, so the other one is uh, wood products. Okay, so that's the uh, crop. So when a comb reaches its full height and after it's been seasoned for a few years, getting more dense, that is uh, used for various wood products. The U.S. currently imports $500 million worth of bamboo wood, wood products every year. It's a big market, yeah. and but it's all made in China. Okay, that's that's really the case. So you can imagine that companies that buy everything from China would like to avoid all the logistics and be able to have it locally grown and available. And that is what is coming for the, the wood industry there. Yeah. And and you can see too how well this crop grows just by visiting some of the Florida botanical gardens. I, mm. It always stands out to me a lot when I see them. Mary Selby Gardens in Sarasota, the Ringling Brothers, Sarasota, um, over here at um, the Ford and, and Edison Estates. And you can see these these big stands of bamboo. And I think, wow, why aren't more people growing this? It's so beautiful. Not only is it food and wood, but it's also very beautiful too. Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. interesting. Uh, but now tell me about the crop. I know it grows fast, but how fast does mm. it actually grow? Yeah, so it is interesting. Uh, you know, it's normal for people to be a little bit skeptical that it is one of the fastest growing plants in the world. Yeah. That might scare I, I gardeners, was. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. By the way, let me just point out, uh, mm-hmm. people worry about getting something that could be invasive. This is very common. And there are types of bamboo that can be invasive. They're running types. They create a forest. And the clump type uh, bamboo, which you see in the background of my uh, screen here, is is not invasive okay it it grows in a clump it's like a almost like a tree and it has multiple clumps but they stay put they just the clump gets a little bit larger every year so going back to how fast does it grow we found that during the season that we're harvesting the shoots so we come in in may and harvest twice a week through the end of october so six months we're getting this fresh produce of bamboo shoots and What we found was that they grow so fast that between one time you're there and the next time, you might have missed them. They they we cut them when they're 10 to 20 inches tall. Well, we found that they're growing a foot a day. Well, that doesn't leave you much of a window. They they are growing, and all of a sudden they're 30 feet tall. And so it is uh it's kind of amazing. So everything that it relates to how fast it grows is a good thing. It affects its productivity, how big the crops are. It outruns its vulnerabilities. And even interestingly, uh, we don't have pests and disease. So you can imagine that would be a different world for citrus farmers that spend all their time on pests and disease. We don't have that. 
Wow. And and how is it propagated? Is it division, seeds, um, cuttings? Yeah, you can do it in different ways, but tissue culture is the way okay. for commercial farming. And we have tissue culture available for the plants in Florida today. And that's that's how it is propagated. It, so you, this is where you can roll out uh, thousands and thousands of plants. Right. And then what is the, the process? Do they start in greenhouses or in shade houses? Yeah, so it, it and there are choices here, but you can imagine the tissue culture companies grow something that can be uh, provided to nurseries at a uh, very small uh, plant level, or they can grow them uh, to another stage. But just imagine it goes from tissue culture to nurseries to ultimately being put in the ground. Right. And then what's the life of that plant once it's in the ground? I, I'm going to say a long time. Okay. Yeah. It is. 50 to 80 years. So, wow. so it's not like you have to replant the plant every year for new crops. No, it's getting bigger. So it's it's doubling in size approximately every year for the first five or six years. And it becomes a plant that has cones that are four to six inches in diameter when it's mature. And the base of the plant can be 10 feet in diameter. And the height of the cones 40 to 50 feet tall. Wow. Yeah, from so, what you see in the background, which is like one year old. Yeah. So what, uh, when you're producing it for food, how is that harvested? And is the parent plant left in the ground then? Yeah. So you harvest it by just imagine walking down a row and looking at the base of the plant and you see some one of the sh new shoots 10 to 20 inches tall, and they're they're beautiful, actually. They're colorful. They, would, they make you think fresh. And so you simply take a battery-operated saw, a sawzall, and you go right down to the base of the, at the ground, and zzz, it's cut. It's soft, okay, at this stage. It's like a, it has a soft outer covering, and it's cone-shaped, like an upside-down ice cream cone, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you do that, you put it in your box, you go to the next plant, you get ones there and so forth. And you uh, put them in a bin uh, on a trailer. You uh, ice top them to keep them cool, take them to our packing house. <clears throat> and that's where they're cleaned up and sanitized and, and cooled and uh, sent off to Asian American grocery stores around the country. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Like so many fruit crops, it sounds like it's labor intensive. Do you know of any plans or, or opportunities for robotics companies to come in and, and design something that could harvest? Yeah. You know, everything is labor sensitive. OK, yeah. because we don't have much labor. We're think of it this way. It's not hard to do the labor that we're talking about, but um what we tap into is H2A uh, labor that is available generally from Mexico. And we, we're we the off-season for the citrus industry. So all of these H2A professional harvesting companies want to do something with their labor. So we're the guys in the off-season. We're completely available during that time. So it works well. Oh, that's good. And then mm -hmm. what about harvesting for wood? Is that the same thing where you pick and choose from each plant or do you clear cut it? So what we understand today is that we're, we're going to be selective. So you let the, the combs, the larger combs uh, remain either for a couple of years or maybe even as many as five years before you cut them. So that depending on the use of the, of the wood. And then you come in and you you cut it, you pull it out, and and you have the process that you can imagine for wood, and including drying, and then possibly uh, chipping it down to uh, something that is easily uh, moved and shipped to your uh, your ultimate customer. But I got to tell you, in wood we have many types of uses, and so the the way that this process goes you know, will vary. Right. But but going back to the, the labor issue, I really think that we will develop mechanical harvesting. And so I've had um, consultants from the forestry industry come in and look, and they say, look, it's not complicated to uh, mechanize this. It's just that you use smaller equipment than you would use for pine trees. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And so what kind of room does a grower need to be able to grow and start this? Yeah. So you don't want to have two acres out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, bigger farms uh, give you commercial viability. Mm -hmm. And so I would say uh, just a trend that we found is for the uh, quality of the farm and the commercial viability is to do this in, as part of larger farms. Mm -hmm. So this is something that uh, the company that I work with, Greenfield Bamboo, does. We are a farm developer and manager. So we go buy larger properties, hundreds of acres, divided into 10 acre parcels, investors purchase those, they get the deed, and then we contract to build it, maintain it, do the caretaking, and to manage it. This is the best thing out there right now that I see. Right. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. And then, so what are some of the challenges that you face with this market, and how do you anticipate being able to overcome them? Yeah, you know, we're developing a, a market for a, a uh a crop that is going to just ramp up in terms right. of its volume. So at the beginning part, uh, like on the wood, we don't have quite enough wood at this moment to be able to get people to build a manufacturing plant to handle it. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg as part of that. Uh, but I see that coming. On the shoots, we, we don't have a lot in the way of us. It will ramp up in its volume. But what we've done so far is we've worked with wholesalers for the produce for these Asian American grocery stores. And I anticipate that, first of all, it seems like the money is in the food. And you can imagine for a healthy food, there is a lot of attraction to being able to have that for developing new uh, brands and so forth. Think like having uh, bamboo shoots for a certain uh, new brand sitting in Whole Foods. Well, this is where it goes long term. It goes from the 21 million uh, Asian Americans as the population to the, the rest of the population that it kind of focused on the, the people that are interested in that, that are health conscious. And so it'll fit right in there. Oh, yeah. So are there other regions in the U.S. where bamboo farming uh, is prominent or that that could have success? You know, I would imagine that it will develop in various types of, in different parts of the country, particularly the, the Southeast, but it would use running type uh, bamboo and we have less experience with that. So for now, I would say we have found the sweet spot for growing bamboo and it's right where citrus is growing today in Southern Florida. And that's the best place to grow it today. Yeah, that's great. That's a huge opportunity for cit citrus growers, isn't it? It is. And for bamboo growers. Yeah. Yeah. That that's we have it. plenty of land available mm -hmm. at reasonable prices and, and it has the exact infrastructure that we need for growing bamboo. Right. And what's the water demand for bamboo? It uses a lot of water, kind of like citrus, maybe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, so it uses a, a lot of water. And it uses a lot of fertilizer. These are the two main things for uh, uh, bamboo farms. And it, it, you'll notice I don't say anything about uh, dealing with pests and disease. It doesn't have right. a cost associated with that. It's really about weed control in the beginning and then uh, growing it to maturity. And, uh, and so you do need uh, water as part of that, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're lucky that we differ from California and that, that we get... Sufficient water, pretty much. I know, uh, and not always. Yeah, and but. and remember, Chrissy, we're buying existing orange groves that have permitted wells. So yeah. we that's important to us that we can work with something that's already there, a source. That makes sense. And you also established the Florida Bamboo Growers Association. So tell me about that organization. Yeah, you know, we needed to uh, develop the industry well. You know, think like, you know, characteristics of a healthy industry. It's growing fast. It has uh, competition. It has uh, maybe thought leadership, this kind of thing, and connections to the markets and uh, uh, connections to funded research like University of Florida IFAS. This has been tremendously important to us. And so when we developed an independent grower association, it helped that process happens. So we have a great board of directors that represent the, the growers of the industry. 
I happen to be uh, president of the association, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But even in the last year, uh, we uh, did research on the productivity of the plants to help us understand from a proof of concept standpoint, how much money can we make? How much uh, uh, production will it have? And we we got huge success out of that. And it was uh, really validating. So uh, thank you to the University of Florida IFAS uh, for that help. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And then, so where can people find you if they want more information, if they're curious about growing or what uh, what Greenfield does? Yeah, and I would say uh, two website connections. One would be the uh, Grower Association, which is fbgabamboo.com. So FBGA is Florida Bamboo Grower Association. So fbgabamboo.com. And then the other is greenfieldbamboo.net. Good. Yeah. And we'll include those in the show in the show notes as well. Yeah, yeah. And if you go to both of those, they'll give you great resources. And on our Greenfield's website, we have video series that in two minute clips explains how the business works. And yeah, at the Grower right. Association, you see you learn all kinds of things and get connected to the industry. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. So one last question for you. Mm -hmm. Why do you serve the industry? What are you most passionate about? Um about about this, uh, seeing, given your background? You know, I've always been entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. And so part of entrepreneurial is being able to see something that not everybody can see, seeing the opportunity, a little bit of vision. And you spend some time in the farms and you learn something about how they grow. And I can connect these dots to it's going to go. This is not something that is going to be one of those 50 crops that we found that were a waste of time. Right. No, this is happening. So I'm excited about that and passionate about that, about being able to see how we can take this crop and turn it into a good return on investment for for everybody. Yeah, I love that. Well, thank yeah. you so much for joining me today. I learned a lot about this new crop, well, new to North American crop. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to touring one of these farms soon if you hook me up. Yeah, we're going to do that, uh, Chrissy. Yeah. But listen, thanks for your time. Yeah, and thanks to all who are watching or listening. If you want to learn more, the links, as I said, are provided in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe to North American Egg Spotlight on YouTube, Rumble, or Telegram channels. The podcast is also available on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, or Listen Notes, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like the episode, I'd love it if you shared it. And have a great day. Bye.